Having finished the previous module on prenatal concerns, here we are now on module six, as we proceed on a somewhat chronological fashion. We are considering early stimulation and early deprivation, and this module will cover the classic Jimmy and Johnny study. Um, it is essentially a biological maturation experiment highlighting the classic debate between nature and nurture. It is a co-twin control study um, done by Myrtle McGraw. We proceed by discussing early motor de development programs designed to make kids advance and be precocious relative to the other kids. Um, at least that was the goal. What were their rationales and were they effective? Finally, the flip side of early stimulation is early deprivation. We are going to look at specific cases of children that experienced some of them very extreme deprivation. Let us begin with Jimmy and Johnny. Johnny was a twin who received the exercise. Jimmy was the one. He received none of the stimulation that Johnny received. Mm -hmm. Every self-respecting exercise science student and education student are to be familiar with this classic study. Not to say it did not have, have any flaws. Please take note of the asterisk. It was found out later that Jimmy and Johnny were not, in fact, identical twins. They were what you call dizygotic twins, or in layman's term, fraternal twins. Think for a moment what that means in terms of the integrity of the experiment. Interesting results. Apparently, with respect to fundamental motor skills, and by that, it refers to typical motor indices as a baby, reaching, grasping, rolling, creeping, crawling, um, cruising, and finally getting to stand up. There were no differences between Jimmy and Johnny. In other words, there was no effect of the early stimulation program. Despite that, several profound differences were noted. Although um, for Johnny, this advantage was more on the cognitive and motor development combination because Johnny, who was exposed to a number of situations, exhibited good analytical and problem-solving skills. In addition, he was very aggressive in learning new ones. Jimmy, on the other hand, having had limited contact with other people, he was not as confident nor as efficient in his movement. He typically took longer to acquire motor skills. However, there is some sense of advantage for Jimmy as well, and we will talk about this a little bit later, uh, specific to a skill, learning to use the tricycle. Uh, please remember that the early stimulation program was designed to get kids started early. Well, they tried that with, um, with Johnny. They tried pushing onto him uh, the tricycling skill, but it actually backfired. On the other hand, for Jimmy, doing nothing, uh, bided his time, and when the time came, they introduced the skill to Jimmy, and he took to it rather is easily. So that this result argues for what has now been described as readiness, okay? Echoing that idea that the McGraw study is actually uh, peppered with mistakes, here are the confounds. Johnny, in fact, based on the tests at birth, appears to be the weaker of the twins. Um, there has been a suggestion that he might have developmental delay at birth. What was indicated was flaccid muscle, t muscle tone and weak reflexes. Thus, the logical choice of Johnny receiving the training. But that already by itself is a fatal flaw. To begin with, since they are not identical twins, you are not comparing apples to apples. And the fact that you gave the weaker of the twin the training, it probably explains the non-significant effect in the motor milestones. Why both of them, despite one having training and the other none, both of them achieved it at normal ages. This refers to the milestones within the first year. Well, what might have happened is Johnny, because he received the training, despite being the weaker 
of the two actually experiencing, experiencing some sort of catch up. Finally, the confound of uh, incomplete experimental control. Imagine that at the end of the day, with both twins away from the parents, who did mom and dad play with and actually received um, sort of a compens compensating attention? Jimmy, and that's because he was awake. He was bored throughout the day, did not receive any special treatment. So at home, mom and dad want to play with the babies, and in fact, it was Jimmy. Johnny, after all that ruckus and activity from the lab, slept and basically um, did not participate. So please take note. Classically, we have to be able to compare apples to apples. Nature has to provide that structure. In this case, the genetic DNA of monozygotic or um, identical twins should have been used. Um, nurture is the platform for which nature is supposed to flourish. Within that uh, set of conditions, nature is expected to um, maximize its capabilities as nurture molds and shapes this structure. To remind us again, from a dynamical systems perspective, nature is the organism's makeup, and nurture, a uh, combination of both the environment and the task conditions or constraints, essentially mirroring what we've talked about in dynamical systems constraints model. Proceeding with the concept, yes, we acknowledge that this is a flawed experiment from the very beginning. However, we cannot ignore the important concepts that were raised. We already talked about readiness. In the case of Johnny, they were trying to get him up, they were trying to get him to be precocious. Well, it, if he wasn't ready, he wasn't ready. In other words, at that point, he did not have the minimum requirements established. If, they, if he did, then he is ready. Um, a little bit more details later. Catch up. This is the theoretical predetermined trajectory or predetermined pattern for um, a certain individual. But if that child is somewhat delayed or deprived, there is that observed phenomenon of catch up. Once care and nutrition and support were given, um, organisms tend to experience, um, organisms tend to experience a surge in development in order to catch up. Um, the third idea that was raised is that of critical period. Critical periods, you've heard this already in terms of the prenatal module, uh, having to do with the uh, embryonic or um, epigenetic stage. Similar concept is expressed here, but in biology, this is a very um, particular meaning. When you describe a critical period, it is a very strict time era of particular sensitivity to stimuli. It is when a specific behavior needs that stimuli in order for the behavior to be expressed. Okay, let's do this in detail. Readiness. These allude to essential antecedent conditions. In other words, what makes you ready? It means that the weakest link is now in place. What are the necessary elements for an individual to be ready? Couple of things will be a couple of these will be discussed in later chapters, but here they are for now: physical growth, neural and cognitive ability, and motivation. Take note: neural and cognitive ability. We've talked about that in module three, cognition, and motivation part is subsumed in module four when it when we talked about affective and socializing agents. Uh, physical growth will be discussed in a later module. Here's a hypothetical catch-up curve. The dark line is supposedly the ideal estimated growth path for a child. Once it deviates in this dashed line, 
all possible scenarios could have happened. Uh, was there illness? Was there injury? Was there deprivation? Did the family move? Was there divorce? Any some sort of upheaval in that person's life can have a potential to derail that hypothetical curve. But once it is restored, in this case, in this graph, they're talking about anorexia. Uh, in other words, the starvation phase. Once it is restored and support is provided, the phenomenon that has been consistently observed is a surge in growth that catches up to what um, is supposedly an ideal curve. We will talk about catch up in relative to two conditions, two specific case studies. One of them was Anna. Uh, this is a child that was left in an attic, um, not found for about five and a half years by the time they um, the uh, CPS, the Child Protective Services, found her. She was about six years old. So the concept of deprivation, when did it begin? Um, or what I called abuse, began at about six months. Um, she was held in the attic quite severely because... Um, in an attic, you experience extremes of temperature, very cold and then very hot. She was provided the subsistence um, living, in other words, just enough for her to live, not to die, food and water, perhaps. But because this went on and on from six months to about five and a half years or six years old, that is a length of time for being deprived that is profound, significantly long. So when you look at the text, did Anna catch up? Was she saved? Did she live long enough? Bottom line is, when we talk about deprivation and when we talk about catch up, three things that you have to consider. Finally, the last of those three important things raised by McGraw are critical periods. Note that this, this is a theoretical proposition. There are four criteria that establishes, that establishes a critical period. There is a specific time limit from this to that when an appropriate stimuli must be present. It is at that crucial sensitive period that it is needed in order for a behavior or for a, secondly, a permanent and durable change to transpire. In our case, change in behavior. Critical periods have been applied to biology. The change might not have anything to do with motor, but maybe it has to do with physiology. In this case, for us, it has to be number three, specific to motor skills. Finally, the fourth component to that, there must be an identification of the components that describe the system to be ready. Okay. In other words, there's a progressive lead up and where at this point there are clear indications that this, the, the organism is ready and now the critical period begins. Okay, step back. Do we have enough empirical data to show this? Or is it still a theoretical proposition? Think about this. Are individual developmental schedules irrelevant? Or are we ruled as humans by a definitive time frame? If we are to pursue that question, what data do we have? Okay, maybe I should frame this. Is there evidence in the animal kingdom, apparently there is. With respect to songbirds, these are um, the avian population that produce wonderful music. A songbird, whether that's a lark, a nightingale, uh, I forget now which species, apparently that bird has to hear the mother's original bird song within 100 days, and that's the critical period. If not, it's kind of tragic that you have a songbird who will now become songless. If they did not hear that stimulus, they will not be able to develop their own songbird.
series of studies of newborn monkeys raised in the dark in this case uh, the absence of light what happened well uh, they were severely deprived and therefore it was there was no turning back they could not discriminate simple shapes in a follow-up study they were also um, lagging in reflexes um, classic another classic monkey study deserves some mention here because hubel and weasel the two authors actually received the Nobel Prize for the series of studies having to do with the development of the uh, retinal cells. Um, the monkeys were their own, the subjects were monkeys and they were their own control. One eye was allowed to open and close as it pleases, but the other eye, which is the control eye, was sutured shut. What do you think happened? Summary result, there was near vision loss on that sutured eye. More relevantly, what was seen macroscopically, the monkey was exhibiting near vision loss, had associated microscopic results. Cells in the visual cortex actually were altered. They adapt to the conditions they were subjected to. Here's a brain. At the back of that brain is what you call the occipital lobe. Uh, the nickname for that is the striate cortex because it typically has stripes. Uh, it is composed of dark and light bands um, corresponding to the left and the right eyes. Whatever sutured eye it was, doesn't matter if it's the dark band or the light band, with the absence of light, that's why the study fetched the Nobel Prize. Clearly, what was done outside of the body changed the inside, specifically of the brain. The corresponding sutured eye, if it was a dark band, with no stimuli coming in, that dark band progressively thinned out, smaller and smaller, narrower and narrower, never disappeared. But the fact that there was no stimuli, the corresponding band for the open eye kept getting wider and wider and encroached on the, typically, on the typical landscape of the sutured eye. Let's go back to the original questions. In humans, are critical periods real? While we have enough evidence in the animal kingdom, there is not enough empirical data for humans. We remain to say that it is a theory simply because you cannot do these experiments to humans ethically. Uh, the Jimmy and Johnny study, <laughs> on top of it being flawed, cannot be repeated now. Can you imagine the ethical conundrums where you deprive one person a lot of movement when and enrich another person's conditions? Um, Animal studies, yes. S critical periods have increasing evidence, but with humans, well, all we can say is not enough clear research. However, in naturally occurring experiments having to do with human language learning, um, if you think of cultures whose language are pictorial characters, the Japanese, the Chinese, and the Koreans, it is um, a series of experiments are being done in Oregon, I believe, where they're looking at lexical access, language. It's a different part of the brain that processes these. Whereas for us English speakers, it's more phonetic. We do not look at characters. We tend to pronounce things and be guided by their phonetic equivalents. A is for apple, B is for boy, B, C is for cat. Very different side of the brain. So what they show is if you contrast the brains of these character-driven language as opposed to the phonetic different language, um, it's contrastingly different. However, as we've talked about language, we know that early stimulation is best or more productive if language learning happens, you know, prior to perhaps eight years old because of Piaget. The alternative theory, however, is this. Because the critical period 
boundaries or criteria are so strict. An alternative theory is to say that the human continues to be plastic. We are not bound by strict timelines that beyond a certain time you cannot learn anymore. Well, we have enough proof in language. Even 90 year olds can learn a new language. I submit to you, college students who are taking foreign languages, foreign language courses right now will learn it so much more quickly if they go to a culture, live there, immerse yourself in Spanish on a daily basis. Your cells are still plastic. It can learn. Maybe not as fast as when you were young, but that's the alternate theory. It is not as rigid as what the original proposal for critical periods is. Now, specific early motor development programs, how effective are they? I am not going to go through the details. It is in your text, but an example of them for us exercise science programs, you are familiar with the sink or swim programs where you throw the baby in the water, let them sink or swim. Or in music, the Suzuki method, in, the, in terms of public education policy, the Head Start programs. Bottom line, when they assess each of these individual programs, there are no conclusive studies. When you think about this early motor development program, should you as a parent want to encourage precocity or encourage early successes for your kids, do not sacrifice um, any of your kids' safety or any of your kids' um, well-being at the altar of, you know, this might be the next NBA star. I want to groom him right off the bat. Aim for a simulating home environment. Facilitate the child's natural skills and development. Need to specially mention here. Do you know that there are marathon records for five-year-olds? Five all the way to obviously 95. But the fact that a kid this time may be overstimulated. Who justifies children running marathons at five? And there's a kid training now for a marathon at four. Is that overstimulation on the other hand? Do not sacrifice the kid's safety. What are you putting at risk? His joints, his psyche, are they gonna be burned out by 12? A cursory look on that list of marathon record holders. None of the names that came up early at five, six, seven, eight ever came back to show any achievement of marath for marathon in the older years. While on the other hand, John, um, who's that American champion? John Benoit. Marathoners are known to uh, ripen or to have to reach their maturity at later ages. Well, how many names were repeated in there? Joan Benoit, several years that she had the marathon record. So that's actually the safer way to go, not with a four-year-old or five-year-old doing marathons. And finally, uh, this addresses parents that are actually vicariously living through their kids. It is an injustice if you basically impose your own goals to the kids. You have to allow them room so that their individual personalities come through. In summary, what is clear as far as we have talked about early stimulation and early deprivation, if you deprive the kid very early in the case of Anna, the other case study in the text is that of Victor, uh, a boy found in the jungles of France and it was not until he was 10 years old that he was found out. It, this is your classic real-life jungle book story. He never regained uh, speech the way we speak now. He walked in all fours just as Anna never regained fully her language skills, lots of delays, and Anna eventually dying at about 10 and a half or 11 years old. Do not subject children to early deprivation. It is very clear, the evidence is very clear that there are devastating effects. Certain elements of growth and development have to be there um, at that age. What is not clear is the effect of early stimulation. Parents who justify early stimulation because 
they are gearing their kids up for college uh, scholarships or they will be the next uh, Michael Jordan, the next Wayne Gretzky, the, na the next uh, Tiger Woods. It's not wor worth sacrificing this at the altar of future gains in terms of fame and fortune. Early stimulation, the correlation between high school and elementary sports success or even college success to <clears throat> pro sport performance later is quite low. They will have debilitating effects and the trade-offs are not worth it. 